a clinician of international repute in the field of respiratory dentistry and endodontics. He has 30 PubMed indexed publication on his credit and has contributed to many national and international restorative and endodontic textbooks. The IACDE has awarded him the best reviewer, clinical excellence award and a rising star award. Presently is affiliated as professor in Royal Dental College, Kerala, India, and maintains a private practice in Root Canal Point, limited to his specialty at Cochin, Kerala, India. Clinically, clinically, his present focus is towards microscope enhanced biomimetic tooth restoration, re-root canals to preserve teeth and painless dentistry for all procedures. So without wasting more time, I would like to invite Professor Jojo Go to sir. Sir, please. Thank you, Shanu. Uh, a very good evening to everyone. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, Safe Dental Academy and uh, Dr. Shanov in particular for inviting me to this lecture. Uh, the topic for today's lecture is learn the art of light curing. Um, it looks very uh, simple in terms of the wording, but uh, this particular topic have high value when you want to do high-end composite restorations. So, the flowchart of the presentation, that's today's presentation, will be like this. That is, uh, first, uh, I'll be discussing about various uh, light cure units. Then I will be shifting to uh, various clinically significant factors that will influence your treatment outcome in, when you're doing composite restorations, which includes uh, what are the precautions that you should do when you are light curing on a deep class two, uh, what is angle, the importance of angle of your light cure and its significance in shadowing effect, uh, light di tip diameter, the light cure tip diameter and its significance, why you need a polywave light cure unit, why we need a good radiometer in our office, why we need orange barrier, problems with budget light cure units, you may get light cure unit for uh, 1,000 or 2,000 rupees or even 5,000 rupees. And uh, what evidence suggests on soft start, pulse delay like cure modes, biocompatibility and post-cure reaction. And finally, we'll discuss on various infection control methods for the like cure units. So before jumping into this particular topic, let me remind you, it's a more theoretical than clinical. I generally take a combination of theory and, and theory and practical. But uh, in this lecture, it's more of theory and less uh, uh, clinically uh, oriented pictures I can deliver. But uh, uh, this is a very important topic uh, as far as clinicians are concerned, because if you don't like your it well, it will uh, reduce the bond strength, it can create micro leakage, it can create post-operative sensitivity, which in turn leads to pulpal toxicity, recurrent caries, lack of color stability, increased wear for the composite restoration, and ultimately it can lead to fracture. So to summarize, I can say, if you don't like cure it well, it can lead to all problems for composites. So I generally used to say this uh, uh, during my lecture, that is uh, during our undergraduation or even in post-graduation, we will be uh, asked to learn more about cavity preparations. We'll be teaching elaborately on bonding systems, composites, placement techniques, and many more. And finally, we will uh, say a file at a word, and that is, and then you like your. And that's what we generally uh, teach in undergraduation. And I, I witnessed uh, my own teacher saying the same way, wording, like you just like cure it. So uh, this file letter words makes things, uh, uh, things more simple for us, but uh, we generally overlook uh, this, these words uh, when it comes to the clinical practice. So 
uh, let me tell you an example. Uh, according to many manufacturers' recommendation, using a light cure is as simple as an on-off switch. That's what many uh, light cure manufacturers say. You don't need to learn anything. Or if you want to learn the art of light cure, you just want to keep the finger on the on and off switch. That's it. And most of the light cure have a same on and off switch. But if you look into other uh, uh, technological devices like apex locators, endomotors, or even ceramic units, there is a learning curve for you to do it well. For example, endomotor, you need to know a lot of things about endomotor if you want to do a good root canal treatment. So if you want to take predictable working length, you need to first learn about apex locators. But uh, generally, uh, these like your units, um, we, we generally overlook it by um, understanding the fact that it is not that complicated. All we need to do is just switch it on and switch it off, that's it. But let me uh, tell you that it is not uh, just switching it on and off. There is a lot of things, or I would say a lot of science behind uh, the light cure unit. And I'm gonna enlighten you uh, within my limited knowledge uh, with uh, pictures and making it as simple as possible for the clinicians to understand the importance of a proper light cure, light curing. Now, before going into the topic, let's discuss very briefly about the evolution of light cure unit. First, we had these uh, quartz tungsten halogen bulbs. Um, I would say when I was doing my undergraduate, we had this in our department. The problem with this light uh, cure unit is the intensity that it delivers. That is around 400 milliwatt per centimeter square. And uh, you need more time to cure a composite. A two mm composite, and uh, they recommend 60 second curing, and that's quite a lot of time for for us to finish a restoration of uh, seven mm and depth. Um, so this is not something that uh, we want in our clinical practice. So to reduce this uh, the time factor, uh, researchers had come up with uh, the plasma R cure like your units later. But uh, it, even though it, had, it, it addressed the time factor, that is it uh, uh, polymerizes the composite in three seconds, there is a lot of problem with the plasma arc like your unit. For example, it produces a lot of heat. It is not battery operatable. Uh, it needs a, it's a big unit. It's not easy to carry from one clinic to the other uh, clinic. So uh, that's why even though it's, it serves a purpose uh, in terms of reducing the time, it is not practical in the majority of the clinical practice. A laser, uh, later the argon ion laser that being put forth as a light cure unit, it also take care of the time by reducing the time to less than 10 seconds. Again, the same problem what we had with the PAC had a, we have in the argon light ion laser. That is, uh, the, the machine is cumbersome, it's large, uh, you need a big fan to, cure, to cool the uh, unit and uh, uh, it is not portable. So uh, because of these reasons, uh, we have the modern uh, light cure units called the LED light cure units. Uh, why LED is more popular nowadays is it's highly efficient, it, it has less heat, uh, it is battery operated, whereas the two and three, that is the PAC and argon are not battery operated. You need to connect it uh, to, the, uh, to the power supply in order uh, to work with those units. Uh, it light rates and uh, light need not be filtered unlike the quartz tungsten halogen bulbs, which need a filter to reduce the ultraviolet uh, spectrum of the light so it's light uh, from the source. So these are the evolution of light cure units. So let me just summarize once more, quartz tungsten halogen, then we have the pack, then we have the argon light the lasers, and finally we ended up in light emitting diodes or LED. Now, before, uh, um, going into the clinical significance of the light cure units, uh, let's also discuss about what curing time is required for 
a successful curing. Uh, it definitely depends upon the type and shade of composite that you are using. And in general, we can say the 16,000 milliwatt per centimeter square is required to cure two mm increment of composite. I'm repeating, 16,000 milliwatt centimeter square is required to cure two mm or increment of composites. Now there is a beautiful calculation to find out this, and that is dose divided by intensity equals maximum curing time. Now, for example, in this case, we are taking an example of blue face uh, like the unit from Iocler, which uh, produces 1,200 milliwatt per centimeter square in density. So consider we all are using this. In that case, uh, probably I would say um, we need 16,000 milliwatt uh, centimeter per centimeter square to cure 2 mm. So consider we are using this blue face and it delivers 1,200 milliwatt per centimeter square. So you divide these two, you get 15 seconds. And that's exactly why we recommend clinically uh, that you cure 2 mm increment for 15 seconds. I hope it's clear now. So I hope now everyone understood why we need to cure a composite increment for 15 seconds. And the calculation is this. Next, uh, we need to learn certain radiometric terms used to describe light output from a curing light. Now, please listen to these terms uh, very carefully. And these terms are radiant power, which is designated as milliwatts. Second is irradiance, uh, designated as milliwatt per centimeter square. And the third is radiant exposure, which is designated as joule per centimeter square. Now, what is radiant power? Radiant power is nothing but uh, when you compare the normal bulb we, we have, no? halogen bulb, we will say it's uh, 100 watts or 60 watts. So likewise, uh, the, the, the light uh, that is used uh, inside the light cure unit, it has a power. Uh, and it is uh, generally represented as milliwatt rather than watts that we uh, describe uh, our conventional bulbs. Uh, we describe in watts, but here we describe in milliwatts. Now, what is irradiance? Now, irradiance is the light produced per unit area. That means how much of light is produced by this uh, uh, bulb in a unit area. That is called the irradiance. Whereas radiant exposure is the energy that is received by the subject per unit area. I hope uh, this is clear for everyone. Radiant power is the power of the bulb in milliwatt. Irradiance is the, the amount of light that is produced by the light cure unit per unit area. And radiant exposure is the amount of energy that is received by the subject. Here the subject could be the composite per unit area. Now, these are the three most important uh, radiometric terms uh, uh, for a light cure unit. But among these three, I would say the most significant is the radiance. Now, you may be wondering why radiance is more important because the radiance received by the resin restoration is directly dependent upon the diameter of the light cure unit, uh, the radiant power, and the distance from the light chip. So these three are directly controlled in a clinical scenario. So irradiance is the most significant factor because irradiance is direct, is dependent on the diameter of the light chip, the radiant power, and the distance from the light chip. So first, let me discuss uh, the, the diameter of the light chip. These are various uh, light cure unit uh, tip diameter. So you can see you have a larger diameter here. You have a smaller diameter here, uh, unit here. You, you in fact have an even more smaller diameter here. Now the significance comes here. That is uh, if consider all these light cure units have a, a 
the power of the light is 10 uh, milliwatt, for example. Just consider it like that. All these light here units, the bulb power is uh, 10 milliwatt. You know which will produce the highest irradiance. The smallest will produce the higher highest irradiance because uh, everything is collimated to a very small tip, whereas the large uh, tips like this or this, the effective radiance will be less because uh, the that bulb that is uh, the 10 milliwatt bulb, uh, the, the light that is produced is being scattered to a larger area. So this is what a manufacturer generally does to overcome the economic part. Uh, uh, this small diameter can produce an equal amount of intensity that than that of a larger diameter like your unit, which will produce uh, the same intensity like this, but this have to use a higher uh, power light bulb in, in order to achieve it. I hope I'm not confusing it. I'm just repeating once more. Consider both of this and this is using 10 milliwatt bulb this will produce less intensity than this one because the diameter of the reflective side is more here. So the light will be transmitted or scattered more than this one. Now, that's why the diameter is directly depending on the irradiance. Now let's uh, come into the clinical perspective of the light cure units. The number one is a significant, that's a very significant clinical question. That is, clinical evidence had demonstrated that class two composite dressing have significantly higher rate of caries at the gingival margin when compared with amalgam restoration. Why? Uh, it's, it's a very debatable topic, a very interesting topic. So that means if you do 100 class twos with composite and another 100 with, uh, with uh, amalgam, the amalgam have less marginal decay at the gingival seat than composite. And one of the major reasons for this is the improper light curing of the class two composites. Now for that, let me just show you an experiment which was done by me uh, with, a, with a very good light cure unit in the market. I'm, I'm just uh, uh, blanking it, uh, uh, the, the light cure unit. And I'm trying to test the intensity of this light cure unit with the radiometer. Now, when I kept the light cure unit in contact with the radiometer, you can see the intensity what the radiometer picked was 1,500 milliwatt per centimeter square. You can see it is stable to 20 seconds here. So that means if the light cure unit was kept in contact with the radiometer, it is giving the intensity as they claimed, that is 1,500 uh, milliwatt per centimeter square. But uh, what I had done next was I had kept the light cure unit around five millimeter from the radiometer, five millimeter away from the radiometer. Now you can see there is a drastic change in uh, intensity here. You can see the intensity had dropped to around 450 milliwatt per centimeter square. So what does that mean? It simply means that the intensity what the manufacturer claims, you will get it only zero mm from the tip. Now, the larger the distance from the tip to the subject, the intensity is reducing drastically. I hope now you can correlate what happens when you are curing a deep class two. So you can see when you place the light cure unit on a deep class two, the distance from the tip to the gingival seat is definitely more than seven mm. So seven mm means uh, it is not getting the sufficient intensity to cure the composite. And you may be curing to 20 seconds as, uh, as per the calculation that we learned, but this 20 seconds is not enough to cure this composite because that 1,500 is not received here, but rather it could be around 400 or 500. So this is why we generally recommend to increase the time 
uh, when you are uh, curing a deep class two restoration from 20 to probably 40 or even 60, it would be better uh, for complete curing of the deep clusters. The second is angle will cause shadow. This is also a significant uh, finding that uh, all clinicians should know. That is, if you don't place the light cure unit in parallel with the composite. So in this case, you can see the light cure unit is kept in an angle. Now uh, you, you will appreciate in this picture, there's a lot of shadows that was coming here. And what happens to these areas? These areas, there will be unpolymerized there's no proper polymerization. So if there is no proper polymerization, definitely there is more shrinkage, uh, that, which will lead to post-operative sensitivity, uh, micro leakage, discoloration, and all sort of things that we have discussed will come. So it's very important that you keep the likely very much parallel to the restoration. The clear clinical tip could be the light guide tip diameter. We already have discussed about the tip diameter, the significance of tip diameter in the intensity. That is, uh, larger the in, uh, diameter, you need a powerful bulb to create the same intensity uh, than a smaller diameter like your tip. But what is the clinical significance here? So consider your like your unit. I want all of you to measure the diameter of your like your unit tip when you are when you are going back to your office uh, tomorrow. So consider you have a like your unit of a, of having a diameter of six to eight uh, millimeter, and you know uh, an average uh, mesiodistal and buccolingual uh, length for a molar is around uh, ten or twelve millimeter. So if you are curing with a small like your unit, you may not be able to cover the entire tooth. Whereas here you can see a larger like your unit tip. There you will be able to cover it in one shot. So what is the clinical uh, significance of it or clinical take home message? That means if you're having a small like your unit tip, never mind, but what you need to do is you just want to uh, move it around when you are doing the rest, uh, uh, like curing. You don't need, you should not keep it stable like that in one area because the other area will not be cured. So if you have a small light cure unit, you just move it while curing so that it covers the entire restoration. But if you have a curing light of larger diameter, it doesn't matter, it's gonna address anyway in, uh, in terms of the width. The third thing which I would like to, uh, sorry, the fourth clinical significant factor which I would like to deliver is why you need a polywave. To understand it, you should go in, we should go a little into the chemistry of polymerization. So, you know, it happens by initiation, um, propagation, and termination. Uh, the initiation happens with uh, the initiators, photo initiators. The most commonly used photo initiators are camphroquinone. So if you look into the color of camphroquinone, you can see it is more of orangey yellow. So you may be wondering then why our composites are white in color. So if you're adding this camphroquinone, you may get an yellow color composite. So what manufacturer does is, manufacturers add other uh, uh, photo initiators like leucerin TP or the ivocerin, which is patented to ivoclar, to compensate or manipulate the color. And that's why we get a range of colors uh, from uh, more whitish, more translucent to more alloyish. So we, they generally add multiple initiators inside the composite restoration. So uh, the take home message is no composite in, in the market will come with one photo initiator. It generally comes with uh, multiple photo initiators, and these uh, three are a few of the examples of the photo initiators in the market. Now, if you look into the the these peak spectrum of these photo initiators, you can see camphorquinone have a peak sensitivity of at 470 nanometer, 
whereas Lucer and TPO have a peak sensitivity of 370 nanometer, and IO serine have a peak sensitivity of 450 nanometer. So what does that mean? It means that if you need to cure all these photo initiators, you need a range of a wavelength from 350 to 500 nanometer. And that is exactly why we need a multi-wave or poly-wave or multi-peak. Uh, each uh, company will call it this in different term. All are same. So that means these like your unit will emit different wavelengths to address all the uh, current photo initiators in the dental resin and in the bonding agent. I hope now it's uh, all, are, all are very clear about why we need a polywave like your unit uh, uh, in our dental office. It is simply because uh, we have different photo initiators which produces free radical. Now, if you don't use polywaves, uh, the free rad the, the, the photo initiators are not active activated well. If the photo initiators are not activated well, it will not produce free radical. So if the free radical production is less, obviously you have less polymerization. If the polymerization is less, it will result in more, uh, more shrinkage, then all the problems what we had discussed will come to the composite restoration. So these are the few uh, poly wave uh, like your units in the market. Uh, one beautiful product is there from Ivoclor. Uh, 3M have one, uh, the 3M Elipar, the uh, Ultraden have the Valo, and there are a few other more in the market. So uh, the take home message is if you have uh, in a position to buy it, please go and buy it because it's gonna make uh, some difference in the outcome of composite registration. Now, I know there are certain light cure units which comes with uh, extra power curing mode like 3000 milliwatt or even in fact, in, even 30,000 milliwatt. So many uh, participants and students used to ask me, what is your take on the high intensity light cure unit? And I would say, I will not use it for direct restrictions because it's gonna increase the stress. It will uh, create a lot of stress to the bond and the bond can fail and more marginal gap between the tooth and the restoration. So delivering double the irradiance, can we reduce the time by half? Uh, this question is significant in deep class tubes. That means I told you in deep class tubes, you need to uh, like cure for a more time. From 20, you need to increase to 40 or 60. But can we overcome with intensity? That means, uh, can we use 3000 milliwatt for 20 seconds rather than using 1500 milliwatt for 60 seconds? The answer is no, you should not use it. Because 4000 milliwatt per centimeter square, five seconds is not equivalent to 500 milliwatt per centimeter square for 40 seconds because the reaction rate is calculated by square root of irradiance. So don't think these are same. In addition, there is another problem when you use 3000 milliwatt per centimeter square, uh, and that is the temperature. So uh, 10 degree rise in pulpal temperature will create irreversible damage to the pulp. That's what many uh, evidence are suggesting. So if you're using 3000 uh, milliwatt per centimeter square like your unit and curing a direct restoration, uh, you will get a root canal in the next one month. That's gonna happen because that will lead to pulpal damage. And uh, after, a, after a week or more, the patient will definitely come, by, come back with pulpitis and it will definitely end up in a root canal treatment. The, the fifth one which we'll be discussing is why we need a good radiometer. Now there are many radiometer in the market. Uh, few light cure units comes with an inbuilt radiometer. But what you need to understand is, for example, these are various radiometers in the market. Look at the sensor. So in this, the sensor is quite large. Here, the sensor is small. This is even more larger, but look at this sensor. It is even more, smaller, and I would say this is the smallest. 
Now, if you use this radiometer to assess the in density of your light cure unit, this may give you a falsified reading because the diameter is small. So if you want to assess the, uh, the, the intensity of your light cure unit, you should have a very good light cure uh, radiometer. And one of the best in the market is Blue Phase Meter 2 from iVoopla. And uh, since the sensors that is incorporated here is large, it is going to pick up the actual intensity rather than giving you a falsified intensity uh, by incorporating a smaller sensor in your radiometer. Now, why you need a radiometer in your office is simply because the light cure output will decrease with time. Now, why it will decrease with time? Because aging of the light source, building, building up of scales on the fiber optic after autoclaving, breakage of fracture when it falls down it breaks and definitely the light intensity is going to reduce presence of cured resin on the light tip you can see a lot of cured resin here disinfectant spray that you use on the tip will contaminate or erode the o-ring that ring that is around the light cure unit tip and if you're using cheaper barriers, uh, that the studies have shown that even that can affect the intensity of the light cure unit. So that is why we need to have a radiometer in our office to check the intensity of the light cure unit. The sixth is why we need an orange barrier. It's a very important uh, uh, but uh, ignored area in many of the dental office. You know, blue lights, that is the light that we use for the light curing, is around 400 nanometer and is absorbed by the retina. And in high level, it will result in irreversible retinal burning. And uh, if it is in low level for a very long duration, it will result in accelerated retinal aging. And that is exactly why we need to have an eye protector when you are using the light cure unit. And the eye protector is generally an orange shield because orange color shield will, will block that blue light and that will uh, help our eyes uh, to be well protected by from retinal damage. The seventh is the problem with budget light, cure, light curing units. Now I'm gonna discuss uh, the problems with the budget like your units. The number one is it uses smaller diameter. And I hope I had discussed uh, about the significance of the diameter on the light cure unit and its impact on the outcome of the light. Uh, uh, with low radiant power, that is, uh, if you, even if you use a uh, uh, bulb that is less than 10 milliwatt, they can still ready, uh, deliver a high intensity because the diameter of the light cure unit is small. Number two is a light beam profile will be inf inferior. Now light beam profile is a very complex uh, uh, area to be understood uh, when it comes to the light. Uh, there are many factors which influence the light beam profile. And I want to discuss two, that is collimation and uniformity that we will see in the next slide. So generally, if you're using a budget like your unit, the light beam profile will be inferior. Number three, electronics may not compensate for the falling output as the battery drain discharges. For example, if your battery is in full power, full power, you, you may be getting at the intensity like what the manufacturer is claiming. But if the, uh, the battery had drained out less than 50, uh, these budget like your unit will not deliver the same intensity as they claim. And uh, that is why we don't invest in these like your unit. And the fourth is may not have been tested for safety or efficiency to be used in vivo. And you don't have the safety uh, brochure with those like your units. But if you look into standard like your units, you can download that safety brochure and they have done a lot of testing in vitro and in vivo to make sure that uh, like your unit is safe to use in a patient. Now we'll be discussing about the second factor that is the light beam profile. I told you one of the light beam profile is collimation and scattering. So if you use a budget light cure unit, it will scatter the light more 
and you know when you scatter the light the intensity what it delivers from uh, at a distance it's it will be quite inferior to a light cure unit which doesn't scatter the light the second is the homogeneity homogeneity means consider uh, this is the uh, light source diameter uh, and you can see in this picture this is the value from ultradent it gives a uniform uh, light beam profile throughout the diameter whereas this is a, a different light cure unit and you can see uh, the uniformity is not lacking here here the uniformity is more at the center whereas towards the periphery it is not uniform so if you invest in the cheaper light cure unit the beam profile will be inferior which involves which includes the beams the light scattering and also the homogeneity or uniformity of the light cure unit the eighth thing which i'm going to discuss is uh, what is the significance of the soft start of pulse delayed curing mode now when it comes to theory this makes some sense because uh, if you uh, use soft start that means less intensity at the beginning uh, you are trying to keep uh, the uh, the this composite in the gelation point for a longer duration now, if you keep it in the gelation mode for a longer duration, you get more free radical motility and there is increased polymerization. That's what theory say. But according to various evidence, clinically, it is not found to provide any significant better performance than the continuous light exposure. So even though there are a lot of hype in the soft start and pulse delay, I still don't uh, believe in it because there is not even supporting evidence to to substantiate this finding. The ninth is the biocompatibility and post cure reaction. You know, when a composite is being cured, it is only cured from 50 to 80 percent. Rest around 20 to 50 percent is uncured. That means there is a lot of uncured methacrylate. The methacrylate means double bonds present within the composite. And these uh, uncured composites, that is a monomer, can leach out through the composite and can lead to pulpal irritation, which is quite possible. And this can be overcome by good curing. If you cure it well, the polymerization, uh, the degree of conversion will be improved and there will be less uh, leaching out of monomers into the pulp. There is something called post cure uh, curing, that means. Uh, the composite will be cured uh, to around 55% uh, immediately after light cure. And uh, probably after 24 hours, you can see there is an improvement in the degree of conversion. So the, what does that mean? It means that uh, don't think that the composite is going to be cured to its full extent immediately after you light cure, but rather there is something called post-cure reaction that happens uh, after like immediately after like you are to around 24 hours and that is going to happen within the composite so composite will attain its full strength only probably after 24 hours and that is why we delay the composite polishing for 24 hours so that uh, it is properly set before you go into the final perfect polishing of the composite the last which I'm going to discuss is infection control method. Uh, uh, a few light cure units, uh, the, the, the tip can be detachable. For example, coltin uh, uh, light cure unit, the tip can be detached. In that case, you can put it in an autoclave and, like, uh, uh, and disinfect it. But I will not recommend it because uh, studies have shown that it creates boiler scales within the tips and that will affect the intensity of the light cure unit. In fact, if you use some disinfectants, there are certain disinfectants which will create a coating on the tip, the light tip, and that will uh, it decrease the intensity of the light cure unit. So if you ask me which is the best disinfection method is use of a barrier. In fact, barrier will also reduce the intensity. But I would say the best method rightly available with the current evidence is the use of good uh, barriers, uh, dis disposable barriers to 
and uh, probably if you can you, you can disinfect it uh, once in a day not after every patient if you are using a proper barrier on your light cure unit so to summarize the take home message for this short but very clinically relevant topic could be know your properties of your light cure unit for example which light cure unit you are using what is the diameter of the light cure unit what is the uh, in the the wattage, the milliwattage of your light cure unit. Uh, uh, what is the uh, homogeneity of your beam, whether it is scattering? All these things you should know before you light cure it. Second, use appropriate infection control method, and I would highly recommend to use the barriers. Third, monitor the performance of your light cure unit with a radiometer in a regular interval. Maximize the output from the light cure unit by examining the light tip for damage. If there is any damage, please make sure that you don't use it uh, or probably try to replace the tip for getting the 100% intensity. Protect the eyes of everyone in the operatory. Learn how to use the light cure unit to maximize energy uh, delivered from the delivered to the resined uh, base composites. Develop a technique to prevent uncured resin from adhering to the tip. And many a time when you try to uh, cure it, we have a tendency to keep it on the composite and cure. So the simple trick which I would like to deliver to all of you is uh, when you are trying to cure it, uh, start curing at a distance, okay? And then move. Uh, towards the composite and then touch it so that the outer portion is cured and one, the cured composite will not create any sort of contamination on the tip. Even in the barrier, it will not produce any contaminants. Protect the oral mucus and tooth from thermal changes. You know, it is going to produce a lot of heat. So make sure that you don't cure it for a very long time with high intensity and it will create irreversible pulpal damage and even to mucosal damage uh, for uh, soft tissue, to prevent soft tissue injuries. And uh, finally, most importantly, it's uh, point number nine, I had written is eight, I'm sorry for that, uh, the train your operator. So if you are not the one who used the uh, light cure unit for uh, curing the composite, make sure that you train your assistant well, uh, otherwise it will, all the good work that you do will be uh, going into a failure because I hope now at least you know the significance of uh, curing the composite in the right way. So with this, uh, we are going to end uh, the uh, this short lecture on the learning the art of light cure unit. As always, I would like to extend my thanks to all my teachers. What I'm today is because of them. Um, uh, if you have any queries related to this topic or probably beyond it, you can always contact me in any of these modules. You can contact me via email. Uh, there is an uh, Instagram uh, page called Root Canal Point. You can contact me in that or a page uh, in FP or uh, a similar um, uh, videos lect or lectures which I have delivered before is being updated or uploaded in the YouTube channel, Jojo Kutu. So that's it from my side, over to the organizers. And uh, if time permits, I'll be happy to uh, address a few questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and expertise when it comes towards uh, the using a light cure machine. Uh, I would request all the participants to post your questions in the comment section, which can be rectified. So there's one question. So I'll read out one, uh, a question at a time. Okay. Okay. Um, there's one question. Uh, sir, can you elaborate the effects of heat during light cure? The effect of heat I already mentioned. Uh, the According to evidence, 10 degree rise in pulpal temperature will result in irreversible pulpal damage. So if you want to know the effect of heat, what you can do is take the light cure unit tomorrow, 
put it on uh, your skin and activate. I can guarantee that you won't be able to hold it for more than 10, five seconds. And it's going to burn your skin. So uh, doing that, you will understand uh, the deleterious effect of like your unit on the, on the tooth. And don't think that is going to happen on a tooth because a tooth is a good insulator. But make sure that you don't uh, like, your, like your it for continuously for more than 20 seconds. So if you want to deliver 60, 60 second like your for a composite, especially for deep plasters, what I would recommend is uh, like your for 20 seconds, then give a pause, another 20 seconds, give a pause, another 20. So that makes it 60. So don't use it for continuously for 60 seconds. At the same time, don't use uh, higher intensity for units. That also is going to uh, create some pulpal damage or thermal effect to the uh, underlying soft tissue, which includes the pulp. Okay, sir. The next question is, any tips for orthodontic bonding? Orthodontic bonding. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not an expert in that, so I won't be able to comment on it. But I, I would say you need a higher intensity like your unit uh, because it have to cure through the, probably through the bracket. So I assume you need a higher intensity like your unit, but uh, if someone else can uh, share uh, their knowledge, I'll be happy to receive it. Okay, sir. Um, there's another question. Is there anything specially considering while curing bonding agent as an immediate dentin sealing? Uh, I didn't understand. Immediate dentin sealing? I didn't understand. Uh, 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 sir, uh, the question is related to uh, anything apart from uh, when you're doing an immediate dentin sealing, is there any consideration while doing it like cure? You, you you just because you need to like cure the uh, the bonding agent also bonding agent like curing is very important because you need to polymerize the bonding agent even if you are doing immediate end in sealing and also it depends upon what uh, uh, bonding agent you are using for dending immediate end in sealing for example if you are using a third or fourth generation bonding system or even sixth Type, type A or type 1, uh, the, the light curing should be done with uh, the bond, not with the primer, because the photo initiators are present in the bond and not in the primer. So you should not uh, cure the primer, which I have seen many clinicians doing, curing the primer. Primer doesn't have any photo initiator. So make sure you properly cure the, uh, the, the bond. The bond. If, if, if you're using the universal bonding agents, it's uh, quite common that you just like cure it as close as possible to make sure that uh, it is uniformly polymerized. Or even if you're, if you're doing it on a deep cavity, I would say you need to increase the time by giving uh, two or three uh, bursts of 20 second each uh, like curing so, so that it is also completely polymerized. It's a little uh, uh, tricky question. So I didn't exactly understand what uh, uh, the, 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 the person is looking forward uh, from my side. So I hope I had uh, answered the question. Sir, if curing is going to take up to 24 hours, any special post of instructions to be given to the patient? Not in particular, because uh, the, the immediately after cure, you may get around 60 to 70 percent uh, uh, degree of conversion, which is uh, uh, decently good enough to withstand masticatory force. Uh, the, uh, the, the increase in uh, degree of conversion is uh, maybe 10 or 15 15 percent, which is uh, not that significant to affect any failure or probably to uh, advise any precautions uh, from the patient side. So I don't think that that's going to make any significant uh, problem 
in your clinical practice. So it's just theoretical. Yes, you need to know that there is something called post-cure reaction. Will the breakage of light cure tip affects bonding? Yeah, definitely. It will. <laughs> it will. So if you have a broken light cure tip, <laughs> better replace it. You need to check with the radiometer to understand uh, how much intensity you're receiving if you have a broken or partially broken light. Cure. So are one second curing lights safe to use in context with uh, context of polarization shrinkage? No, I don't recommend one one second light cure unit because one second light cure units uh, will produce higher intensity. I, I would say more than three thousand milliwatt per cent centimeter square. Uh, this will actually increase the stress that is developed within the composite. So you may end up in more polymerized shrinkage. There is something called uh, one second cure, or it is called a power cure. That's a patented product from Iwokler. You can search in the internet what is uh, tetric uh, power fill. So these tetric power fill, uh, tetric uh, flow, power, flow power fill, all these things are special composites that have the ability to adjust to high intensity. So unless you are not using this uh, tetric series power fill composites, which are special composite compared with the regular composite what we have, I don't recommend to use a high intensity light cure unit for curing the composite. Okay, so there's another question. Okay. Will delayed finishing and polishing after 24 hours reduce polarization shrinkage? Very old lock. Yeah. Um, no, it's it's not going to make uh, much difference in terms of polymerization shrinkage. All we uh, say, uh, if you want to get the perfect glossiness of a composite restriction, uh, you need to recall the patient on the next day and polish it because there is something called post cure uh, uh, reaction and uh, a a better the composite in terms of degree of conversion, better the polishability. But it's not going to make uh, much difference in the shrinkage, definitely not. Sir, if we do up to 60 seconds of curing in class two preparation, will it damage the mucosa? No, it is not going to damage the mucosa because it, we are not de uh, uh, delivering the light 60 seconds continuously. I told you, you gave 15 seconds, then give a pause, then another 15 seconds. So 15 seconds into three times. It is not like continuous 60 seconds. If you're giving it 60 seconds continuous, yeah, definitely it will. And if you're placing it, uh, doing it under rubber dam, there's no chance of uh, you know, damaging the mucus. So what happens if we over cure? If you overcure, definitely uh, it will result in palpable damage. There is thermal effect for the uh, the light cure unit. You don't need that. You should have a balance between the the harmful effect of light cure unit at the same time to achieve the beneficial part from a light cure unit. Uh, correct time for curing for both deep and shallow cavities. Pardon? Uh, what is the correct time for curing for both deep as well as for shallow cavities? That depends upon your like your unit, the intensity, what you're using, the distance, the diameter, a lot of variables involved in it. I told you the, the calculation, how we come up with uh, 15 seconds. That is, uh, we need 16,000 milliwatt per centimeter square for two, two mm increment. So if you're using uh, 1,000 milliwatt per centimeter square uh, in density like your unit, you need 16 seconds. And this is going to uh, be 
challenged as the distance increases. So obviously in a shallow cavity, I would say you can stick on to 15 seconds. But if it's a deep cavity, probably you can increase the time. So when do we start using light cure when using dual cure resins? Um, that's a very interesting question. So according to evidence, you should not light like cure it immediately. And uh, uh, evidence suggests that if you po postponed the light curing for five minutes, it is going to reduce the polymerase shrinkage. So the take home message is uh, when you're using a dual cure resin uh, for post cementation, um, uh, don't light cure it immediately. You can wait for five minutes and then light cure it. So if you want to get good predictable result. So what about the interference of chair light while curing? I uh, guess it will interfere uh, with the uh, with the with the composite, and it also depends upon the type of light that is used in the chair. If you're using the modern LED, definitely is gonna affect the light curing. There, there will be some uh, reaction that is happening. So that's why we need a filter. And many chairs have it, and I'm confident also have it. If the filter, you can switch it on and then work. So that's why we put the filter in order to avoid the interference of the ambient lighting or chair lighting on the on the dental composites. If you are using loop, you, you will get a filter. Even in microscope, you get a filter. I think so. We had uh, answered most of the questions. Some questions are actually out of topic. Okay. So most probably uh, if that topic is conducted, we'll try to answer those questions. Hopefully. Yeah. Okay, sir. So, so thank you so much, sir, for sharing your knowledge and expertise. And uh, definitely after this lecture, many of us would go back and substitute the technique of using light cure when it comes towards bonded restorations. So I thank all of the doctors who had attended this webinar. And I hope all of you will depart this session with positive, confident manner. So again, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And thank you all who had attended this webinar and have a great night. Thank you. Good night.